talked about uh, Pakistan and they could very quickly understand the climate change. And this reminds me of something that we took in deep uh, In the earlier part of the 19th century, so that was before 1857, which says, Le saas bhi ahitta ke naaduk hai bhaat kaam afaak ki is kaar gahe shisha gari ka. So you could imagine that in South Asia, early 19th century, people were quite aware of the fact that the ecological scene of the world is very delicate and we need to live to preserve it. So it is quite easy to implement things in South Asia, particularly in Pakistan, which is suffering today. I'm sort of thinking about that if I am eating a um, hanger a month, maybe I should start buying thinner hangers. <laughs> um, but keep in mind that something like that is in the minds of a lot of people. There is a recent article in the journal Nature which publishes papers after a very huge uh, sort of review process, that we had a storm in the East Halifax area. And a graduate student there decided that they're not going to be looking into the sea water. They want to look into the air and see what is in the air. And they found out there's a huge amount of small <coughs> particles of plastic that you are breathing. So during a storm, you may be breathing in a whole hanger within a day. So I think we are basically eating our own actions as we go. There is another statistics that sort of hit me hard. That there are about 2 billion people worldwide who are energy hungry. That turns out to be about 25% of the world population. In Pakistan, it is 50% of the population of the country which is power hungry, and that's 120 million. I think we have a lot of work to do. Now, having said that, we were going to start our food at 2 o'clock. We had a little bit of that. But if there are some burning questions, we can discuss that. Yeah? We were discussing about the COVID area and you said that during that time there was so much money spent on that. What is the positive impact of the environment on the COVID? One more question and we'll then move on because there are a lot of people who want to go ahead. And I'm going to give the I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Amir Asif after this because he you answer that question and then we'll have Amir Asif. Uh, the, uh, and I, I will, I'm very happy to continue the discussion as we have food and and pale puja. That is always always so. So I, I totally endorse that. Uh, COVID is a very very good example. So I, I think your question is, you know, what was the environment when COVID hit? There was an assumption that there will be kind of an immediate decrease in because we were going to offices, we were not going on vacation, we weren't flying at all. And it turns out that now we do have the data and it is much smaller than we thought. So there is a momentary blip and because we are good at adaptation, we quickly found other ways such as excessive buying on Amazon. Right? Amazon Prime, you would literally have a buy street, I saw this, in my own home, three deliveries of Amazon a day. <laughs> So we found other ways to do it and we also found that the blip is smaller because you need it for actually longer period and, and COVID is not a good way to cut emissions. So you have to have better ways of doing emissions. COVID story, I do think so there are good, good scenarios also. The good news was science. The amazing news was anyone who was doing medical sort of research was amazed at how quickly the solutions were found and the vaccine was found. Right? It was also found mostly through global cooperation. If you, if you, there's some wonderful documentaries about it. It was literally between universities in China, universities in, in the U.S., universities in the U.K. 
very quick immediate research. The problem with that is okay, climate does not have a vaccine, cannot have a vaccine. So while we tend to be good at solving problems after they become problems, as a human species, we have not been very good at precaution. Right? The saddest part of COVID is not the money. The saddest part of COVID is that after 70 years of creating an infrastructure of global cooperation, multilateralism, the first thing that ended was that. We immediately became tribal. Right? Every country had its own roots. Every university had its own roots. Right? Put a mask, don't come near me, stop the airport. Germany saying to Italy, I will not share masks with you. Right? So at the same moment that we have the first greatest global crisis of our lifetimes, we as humans went back to this tribal sense of me first, rather than using that infrastructure for cooperation. Both of those things bode very well for climate change, uh, bode, bode very badly for climate change. So, yes, what we found was that you can have micro impacts of reducing actual emissions. So, we found scientifically, we found two things. One, if you reduce emissions drastically, you can see the result. Right? Because, especially in urban places, you saw it for that dip very quickly. Two, however, we found how creative we are at finding new ways for, 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 uh, for, uh, for emissions. Professor Amir Asif, York University Vice President. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. It was a delight uh, listening to you. Uh, so my question is very straightforward. What will it take for the superpowers, the G7 or G20, to look at environmental issues, environmental climate change, seriously? And the reason I'm asking you is this is because to me, an analogy is with indigenous nations. Indigenous nations is their own problem, and still they haven't resolved it, despite all the issues that have been raised. It's very, very local. So do you have any hope that these superpowers will take global climate change seriously? Yes, that is a wonderful question. That's an excellent question. And you know when someone says it's an excellent question, that means they don't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> they are fishing for time. <laughs> opportunity to be hopeful because I do think we need hope. So the thing, what will it take? I think it will take young people. And I'm not saying that as a, as a Nara. There is something, the reason I put Greta up there, there is something actually very different about young people. Young people, you will see this in your own children, actually have started looking at climate as a moral question rather than a science or economic question only. Till now our tools have been science, either meaning that we are rational, I will give you the science, you will change your behavior. You sometimes do, but we don't always. That's why people still smoke and so on. Then the second approach was economics. I will do policy, you know, carrots and sticks, and if you do that right, I will buy the Tesla because you're giving me a subsidy on it. Right? Or I will change my behavior because you're putting tax on it. I think young people are like the generation that is in this room have figured out that there's a moral dimension to this. There's just something wrong about waste. So that is one thing that gives me hope. Where it is also pushing, the other thing is actually your world and mine. I look at the university landscape all across North America and Europe. Unfortunately, not as much in Pakistan. And universities have essentially become really focused on this problem. So there is a lot of wonderful science that we important. My theme there, however, is it's been put on a slight sliver of this, right? The higher end, the, the really cool EV, the really spectacular battery, the really wonderful building material. The type of challenges I'm raising are being left out, not because universities are bad people, but they are in societies where this is not the problem, right? So that gives me hope. The fear that comes with that second hope is, okay, especially with the stock of net zero. My fear is that we will actually solve. First of all, let me say this. I am convinced we will solve the problem. I have no doubt. We are a very smart species. We will solve the problem. My worry is that we will solve it in time. We will solve it in time for ourselves because we are building these fortresses. Right? My city is going to be net zero. 
How is it going to be net zero? I'm going to export my pollution somewhere else. And so I think, and I will end with this, I think we are in a race as a species between human knowledge and human wisdom. I have no doubt that we have the knowledge to link this problem and we have the money. Money is not a problem. We have the knowledge to link the problem. I am not convinced we have the wisdom. Right? That is why I wish my answer to the COVID question was different. I hope I'm not. We are done with the university talk. So, what an amazing discussion we had. Uh, I haven't uh, this kind of uh, event for a while. As I think they say, Yashmana Sahude Vaulia Vindal Satsala Sate Vrerea. So, I mean, some time spent with the scholars worth much more than spent the time anywhere else. So, thank you very much, Dr. Adil. Thank you very much, Mr. Mike Schroeder, for uh, enlightening us and you give us a roadmap what we need to do. As I started my conversation initially, so I started with the Rabbis of the Ilma, so, oh Lord, increase my knowledge. So this phrase uh, beautifully, uh, you know, encapsulate our deep desire to seek knowledge, remind us of the divine blessing that accompany this pursuit. So in our journey through life, the quest for knowledge is not just an intellectual endeavor. It nourishes our soul and contributes significantly to our personal growth. And I think uh, the, uh, the travel that we need to move from knowledge to wisdom, that's uh, as the uh, Honorable Doctor mentioned that's the next stage, but it all will lead uh, us to do more brainstorming and exchange of ideas. It is one of the effort that we have done, and I think now we have that platform in the shop form of uh, book club, so where we can exchange these ideas and uh, where we can work on these. And being an engineer, uh, I mean we can come up with some creative solution to the existing problems as well. So, having said that, uh, I think as uh, Dr. Shmin uh, put that uh, poetry that Lesansti So that reminds me of that butterfly effect that, uh, you know, uh, when a butterfly flag springs on one part of the world, so its uh, effects are far-reaching on the other parts as well. So, I think we should be sort of concentrated to our actions. And uh, as we have learned in those uh, courses as well, three R's, so reduce, reuse, and cycle. So we should uh, focus on those things. And I think if we do all those things on the individual basis and take the individual responsibility, then the things will get better in the long run. So in closing, I want to express my gratitude uh, for your active participation and engagement in today's seminar. Honestly, like on you know, the Sunday, afternoon and uh, with this much silence and uh, with this much focus that uh, you guys put, it is amazing and I haven't seen that in so many other places. So thank you very much for that and give yourself a round of applause for being an active listener and for being innovative this way a huge success. And again, I think the insights and knowledge shared and gained here are the steps towards a more sustainable and environmentally conscious future. So let's go towards that. And we have this reminder on our wrist, uh, I care for my planet. So let's care for our planet. Thank you very much. So just one small thing, I request uh, Mr. Adil Najib to come to the stage. And uh, there is a plaque that, that we are supposed to give to Mr. Rashad Lau who arranged these three workshops. So I request Mr. Rashad Lau to come as well. And I request Mr. Kuchin Chishti to come to the stage. So this is... Can you not request our past presidents to come on the stage please? Yes. Thank you. So Mr. Rishat Lau was uh, the you know, person who designed all those three workshops and uh, he designed all those beautiful uh, flyers 
and it's very actually full of information. I mean, if you go through those, so it will have all the small steps that you need to take on your daily lives that can make our planet a better place to live in. So please go through those. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Rashad Lau. And I request Mr. Adil Najib to give this back to the recognition of the services. Thank you.